Hello everybody. Let me welcome you. I would like to welcome you on behalf of Medico International to the second day of our conference on the reconstruction of the world. My name is Thomas Seibert and I would now like to introduce you to the program, the program ahead of us today and tomorrow. I think that we have two good and important days ahead of us days of a wide-ranging and widely ramified debate on the situation of the world which we are inhabiting together. These are also days for discussing the possibilities of, in fact, making it habitable for all and everywhere. But first of all, let me turn to two questions, two questions which I think not quite a few of you will have asked themselves. And the first question, in fact, needs to be answered and answered separately. The question is how Medico International, as a donation-funded aid organization, really gets to organizing a conference like this and making funds which are quite considerable available to this. But the answer was given yesterday for many of you with the starting events of on Haiti and Moria. We started focusing on these two islands and the situation of their inhabitants in order to share an experience which all of us are making again and again in our work as an aid organization. Haiti and Moria are demonstrating that what our world is suffering from is that not there is no space granted for all its inhabitants. In fact, it shows that our world is taking away this place to live from more and more people. And we can experience on Haiti and Moria that this is not just an issue of poverty, but in fact that this place to live is robbed from people by violence and is denied from them by violence. At the height of the migratory movements in 2016, an estimated 5,000 people rigidly drowned. And this was not simply the consequence of shipping accidents and inclement weather. It was the consequence of a deliberately planned and deliberately implemented policy. It was the consequence of political decisions which were taken by those who were responsible with a seeing eye and being fully aware of what these co decisions would mean as a consequence. These were death sentences which were deliberately made and these deliberate death sentences, and this may be the biggest of all problems, these were expressly welcomed and deliberately supported by large portions of people in our society. Those who made these decisions and those who welcomed them are united by their fundamental com contempt of those who became the objects of their decisions and contempt of their humanness and thus of humanity itself. And this contempt also happens to those people who at the end of a life sinking in poverty and violence are dying of incurable exhaustion. They do not die because Haiti would be an island of misery by nature, but because the once prosperous country was deliberately pushed into misery and is being pushed into misery again and again every day. And again, this is a consequence of deliberate decisions. As an aid organization which is active with its partners on Haiti and Moria and in many other places in this world, we are witnesses of what is happening in this world every day in a special way. But our work does not just teach us, does not just teach us what the nature is of the deliberately brought about but certainly deliberately condoned misery in this world.
It also teaches us that this misery is growing every day, but it also teaches us that these zones of devastation are growing every day on Haiti and Moria, we also learn, and in many other places, that people are not accepting this situation that they are being pushed in. And they're fighting this fight not just for themselves, but for all of us and for a different world which is possible. Helping these people cannot mean to give them always too scanty housing, to give them ever too little food and always insufficient health care. It must mean standing by their side in their resistance against their miserable situation. It must mean making common cause with their resistance, putting up a resistance together. This is, as Hölderlin said, we are not what we are, but what we are seeking. This is all we are. And this is why we are running this conference. We want to find out, along with all of you, what the nature of this world is, why this nature is so, and how this could possibly become completely different. That is, how we can turn this world into a better one. Each one of us will have to do this on their own behalf and on their own responsibility in order to find a place for themselves and for others that can be lived in well. And this is why this conference is called Reconstruction of the World. And this brings me to the second question. The question is why the first two letters of the word Reconstruction have been put into brackets. There are two answers to this question. First of all, we put the first two letters in brackets because the world never was the way it should have been. It has always been a world of misery, of violence and contempt. The world which we want to create and should create will be a new world and if we are lucky it will have to be a completely new world. If still, and this is the second answer, if we are speaking of reconstruction and not of the construction of a better world, then this is because the misery of the world is so deep and the destructions have progressed so far that the new world, if it comes, will have to live with the destructions it has suffered for an unforeseeably long time. The new world will have to suffer under the old world for a long time and in fact it will have to do so so that we never forget what happens and what what happened and what is still happening and this brings me to the six lectures which we're hearing today and tomorrow and which we will then discuss in forums afterwards and in a final panel all these lectures will focus on the situation of the world and they all will pose the question how this world can be changed in an emancipatory way. What all these lectures have in common as well is that they're describing this world based on its capital, capitalist constitution. The misery of the world is the misery of capitalism. Wanting to overcome misery means having to overcome capitalism. In the long term, of course, we will not have succeeded with this by tomorrow, but it should not be too long term, however, because otherwise there will be no world anymore which could be liberated towards the good. And as we say, this is the seriousness of the situation we are in. I can't preempt and I don't want to preempt what the answers of the six lectures will be. I can only point out the problems the problems which will, developed, will be developed in their six lectures and which will then be surveyed for any possible solutions. First, Ulrike Hermann from Berlin will describe the capitalist world as a world of ecological destruction. So this is a world which 
needs to be changed everywhere in the world and especially here in its global north because compared at a global scale, we here are benefiting from the dominant world order despite our own misery. We have part in what we of medio medical call the imperial lifestyle. The situation on Haiti and Moria will only improve if a lot becomes different here, or even everything becomes different here. That is, if we overcome a capitalism which can't act in any different way than driving the world every day to the brink of destruction and even beyond this, more and more. In the second lecture, Sandra Met Sandro Mezzadra from Bologna will describe globalization of the continued presence of colonial presentation of the world which started from here. He will point out that the colonization and globalization of the world has led to its total mobilization. But he will also point out that the movement from Europe into the world is not only today returning to Europe and that our relationship with the movements of migration expresses in a condensed way the relationship which we have towards the world. In the third lecture, Rita Segato from Buenos Aires will develop that and how our capitalist presence has resulted from patriarchal dominance that has existed for millions of years and how it still dominates all the generation, all generations. And she will point out the guiding sentence for Medico that we need to act locally, but if it is to be successful, we always have to have the world in mind. And she will explain this to us in a way which will take us to the most distance distanced places, but also to the proximity to the world, to the relationship, in other words, which we are taking with each other every day. And in the fourth lecture, Achille Membe from Johannesburg will speak of a biopolitical world as its philosophical determination. That is a world in which political power follows the either or, making life or pushing into death. Member will point out that the term of biopolitics today is replaced by or needs to be replaced by the term of a necropolitics, a politics of death. As uh, Mbembe points out, ultimately it must be about the generalized instrumentalization of human existence and the material destruction of human bodies and populations. Due to the already realized degree of this destruction, a politi policy to overcome this biopolitics and necropolitics of worldwide liberty and equality will have to be a politics of repairing already uh, destruction which has already happened. Susan Backmoss from New York will then speak in the fifth lecture and will insist on the insight which is expressly shared by Medico that a policy of repair will have to make world history and thus must deliberately want world history. A politics of world history will thus be in the tradition of modern revolutions, it will have to try to find an answer to the question what revolution means today and how it can be made and who can make it in a successful case and who should make it. That a revolution like this must adopt a constitution, that it must adopt institutions, and that it must especially follow Article 28 
of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights will be the topic of the lecture of Thomas Gebauer from Frankfurt, who has been the managing director of Medico International, or who was managing director of Medico for a long time. This article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 28, commits all of us to the creation of, let me quote, a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. Let me conclude this introduction into the program of this conference by pointing your full attention to this circumstance. The statement I've just quoted does not speak of a limited, not of a partial, not of a preliminary realization of the rights which we awarded each other and which we promised each other, but it speaks of their full realization, that is, their realization for all and for each individual here and everywhere. It is pat patently obvious that this statement does not speak of the world as given today, but of a world that is yet to be created. How we can do this together, we will discuss this further in forums after each lecture and in a final panel, for which we have invited more speakers from all over the world, speakers who we thank just as much as those who I have named by their names. Let me also thank all those who have contributed to the making of this conference and who will make sure today and tomorrow that we can hear of and speak of the world which we want to create together. So let me say this on behalf of all our colleagues and let me mention Julia Antonio and Andreas Schult and I'm mentioning them because they have not just worked for their own ideas, but for the ideas of all the others for months, and they had to bear responsibility for all of this. So let us now start, and let me hand over to Florian Schwind, who will uh, facilitator of the next forum with Rika Hermann. Florian, are you here? Okay. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. We'll start with lecture one on the need to no longer be allowed to grow on the world situation of capitalism before the planetary ecological collapse. Now, we are not going to present the ecological collapse per se here. We're assuming that we all know about it, that we can know enough about it to not have to introduce that topic again. Today is about clarifying how we can avoid it, prevent it, get away from it. And uh, we have Ulrike Herrmann here. Her latest book is called Germany, an Economic Fairy Tale. And she'll start talking about uh, the need to no longer be allowed to grow. We know capitalism is capable of a lot of things, but of that it isn't. So we need something else, something that is different from what we know. It can't be capitalism. And it can't be the alternative that we're all familiar with and that has failed in the path. In the past, it's the third path, as it used to be called, but no one embarked on it, really. And then we'll have a forum after Ulrika's presentation where there will be a discussion. Ulrika will speak for 30 minutes, and then we'll hear Nina Troy in the forum from the Konzeptwerk Neue Ökonomie. They also helped organize the degrowth conference, post-growth conference. And everyone who's watching and listening can also be part of our discussion. You can do that by using the uh, um, function down here, F and R, and there you just click and you can enter a question or a comment and be part of this. The medical team will be reading your comments and questions, will sort them, and will then uh, share them with us in our forum that will follow after the presentation. So you can participate online. We'll see how many people can take part directly. We do have a lot of people accessing the event 500 
at this point in time. And uh, so you can use this FNA feature, but you can also um, partake directly. I'll say more about that in a moment.